All right, so uh, we carry on in the story. A uh, refresher from last time, we kind of had the end of the Abraham saga in a certain way. Um, all of the different parts of the covenant are kind of wrapped up. We have a child, we have the blessing, we're in the land, and because Abraham had the negotiation with where Sarah would be buried, we officially own some land, not just water rights, not just like <laughs> usage as like a, a rich guy who's coming through with a bunch of animals. So we have everything complete. Now in 24, we have this next story, which I know chapter 24 is long. If you didn't get to it all, we can still talk through it. Um, the story is pretty is straightforward in some senses and not in others. But we see that Abraham too is at the end of his life. And so the one thing he's concerned about now, because there's always one part of the covenant that's in jeopardy. He has his son. In progress. Hi. Hey. Ah, we just, we're just started. Um, so just doing a refresher, catching up to where we are. Okay. So the covenant is, is stabilized, but now we're looking at making sure it continues. And the next thing is, well, I have a child, but now I have my son Isaac, I have my and son I need Isaac. to secure Isaac's future. So that's where we hit today, is finding Isaac a wife. That is what this whole story is, is finding Isaac a wife. So for those who read it, or, or even if you only read parts of it, what were some initial thoughts of this story? I know it's long. We'll talk about why it's long. What are some initial thoughts? The main thing, the main story was that they, Abraham wanted Isaac to have a wife from the original family uh, place, not from Canaan. It doesn't explain why, but I guess it's obvious. And, uh, and he sends his servant with all the goodies to, to uh, get her and then um, finds a cousin. I think it's a cousin. It's a relative of some kind rela related to his brother and maybe his brother's grandchild, I'm not sure. Um, and um, she agrees to go back with him. And uh, turns out I think is actually 40 when he gets married starts having children. I Does think that's, that? that might be in the next um, chapter where they say he has all his kids 40. Oh, okay. That's a, I, suddenly he gets older. Uh, so it's a really straightforward story. There's a lot oh, of story. They say, this is what we're going to do. And then they do it and then they do it. It's a story. And then they do then they have her and, uh, is there anything? Um, uh, yeah. Somebody's getting feedback. We're getting interference, I think, from Mary Ellen. Yeah, I think it's Mary Ellen. Um, um, what do I want to say? Open things in the background. I was closing them, so I'm sorry. I didn't know it affect everyone. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you know, one thing, uh, when I read it the second time, it apparent Abraham actually says, tells his servant to go to his kindred. You know, and so not only does he want to find Isaac a, a wife from the homeland, he's sort of implying it should be from, you know, from family. Yeah. And, and that's exactly who the servant finds, of course. Me. Um, I think he was preparing for the future, that God had promised him all this land and all these descendants, and um, to... Um, I don't know what I, I'm going to use the wrong word, but it's the only one I can think of. Contaminate his lineage with a Canaanite wife um, did not bode well. And I think that, in, at least initially with Isaac, he wanted to keep the bloodline 
strictly his own. So. I think partially too that he, well, he <clears throat> along with that, he wanted the faith to be their faith and continue with the same faith. And it didn't want to, as you say, contaminate that faith with the Hittites, which was different. Any other initial thoughts of what's going on here in this story? All right, so let's dig in a little bit with a, some context building around this story. Because I think a few details would actually help give context to why the story is the way it is. So the phrase that gets brought out as a kind of an explanation. I'm looking for it here. Um, in verse seven, we see this, the phrasing, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me out of my father's house. So this is a little bit of a window into how like, theologians, not theologians, like biblical scholars go about trying to date when a passage is from, especially when you have a book like this that's kind of Frankenstein together. And we've talked a little bit about like that things are pieced together, that we have different traditions coming from different times. And that phrase stuck out like a red flag to a lot of researchers because we've seen the term, the Lord, which is remember the name of God, Adonai, that's when they're doing all the funky things with the letters. So it says that this is the name of God, but you're not supposed to say the name of God, um, which we think is Yahweh. So that's, we have that at the beginning. But when you see the combination of the Lord, the God of heaven is a really common phrase for the writings that are after the exile. Oh, okay. And it says that again when it talks about, oh, Lord God of my master Abraham. Mm -hmm. So do we, this is kind of doing like a little bit of archeology span in, in a composite text is you're not just looking at the themes of the stories, but sometimes you can see phrases that seem out of place in the context of the rest of it. It's kind of like, if you're saying you're gonna get like, if you're gonna go down and do the boogie woogie, like that's not common language that's used and it would date you as a, from a certain time period. Or using slang from like, even like 20 years ago, you can kind of estimate when like something is written. Like you can, like when you see a news article written from the forties, you can kind of tell, right? even if there's no one word that has that phrasing to it, this whole story is littered with it. So this story is not necessarily an original. There's questions of how much this was in the original Abrahamic stories and expanded or kind of like a story that developed in the meantime and was plopped in the middle. Can we do something and try to get rid of the feedback? Oh, okay. Is it bad? Is anybody else getting it or am I yeah. the only one? I, I am getting it also. Okay. Okay. I'm getting it hard for me to hear it. Yeah. I'm I sorry, think it's Mary it's Ellen good. has got a microphone open and a, another speaker or something or other. It Can we turn off? Sorry, Mary Ellen's box always seems to light up. In that <laughs> okay. I will sign, let me sign out of here and I'll come back in on my tablet. Okay. Okay. All right. Come on. Won't let me leave. Right. <laughs> You're a captive. There we go. All right. So were, were you all able to hear that more or less? Even yeah, with you can hear it. It's just, it's hard to pay attention to it. Yes. Uh, I, I think I missed it. a couple words. Yeah. Okay. My apologies. Um, <laughs> it's, not <your> <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> so to, to sum up once again, it the language here, they can tell 
makes this story not from the same time period as the rest of it. Okay. This was likely a later edition or an expansion. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, what does, why add this story in? Well, it's a link, it's, it's an important link. All of this covenant, well, I don't know what part of the story is the most important. Is it the most important that he got somebody from his original place of birth or that he found a son, a wife for Isaac? I'm not sure what the most important part is, but it's, it seems that he, they wanted to ensure continuity. It's, it's a link. Mm -hmm. It seems like it makes sense. I think he was also afraid that maybe um, his son would end up as a uh, marrying a Hittite, and that would uh, kind of dilute their faith, and he didn't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So, what is the issue with marrying someone not from the family? Why is that a big concern? All right, Mary Ellen, are we coming through all right? I, yeah, I'm just trying to figure this out. And so just, you know, I was getting Helen and then she froze. And so I've just been messing around. So okay. let's try again. Okay. So what's the issue with marrying an outsider? Why is that a concern? Well, it might make uh, the faith uh, weaker and it wouldn't, maybe wouldn't continue as it should. And they would lose their contact with God. Was it a religious thing? Was it was the Canaanite religion was different? But they don't really talk about much the Canaanite. They haven't talked about that much yet. That's mm -hmm. more later. Well, they weren't a member of the Jewish faith. Yeah, I mean, outsiders. Mm -hmm. Outsider. Mm -hmm. So, if you remember that we what we talked about last time, the Canaanites are kind of just. A gr like a rough amalgamation of people. It would be kind of like saying the Europeans, like it's, there's a lot oh. of different groups within that group. Oh, okay. And so there's not a centralized Canaanite religion. What there is, is a bunch of local gods. Like every group of people had their own. But that said, marrying someone else would be inviting some of that into yeah. your tradition because the assumption was, you have your gods, I have my gods, we get married, we put both of the gods on the on the family altar. Why it matters that this is a story from a different part in the in the history, the yes, the the insularness of like keep it in the family seems a little bit weird of like Abraham married his sister and now Isaac is marrying his cousin. <laughs> There's a little bit where our modern sensibilities go a little bit. Ugh. <clears throat> um, however one of the big concerns post exile is what do we do with the people that we married when we lived in babylon that's a huge concern because once again the dilution of the faith one of the ways you can make a people group disappear is basically intermarry them out of existence it's something the Jewish community today is actually struggling with is there's a decline in people who profess Jewish faith, not because they're being killed, but actually because they are marrying outside of the faith so much that they're not that temple attendance is declining. And they're kind of have this question of like, how do we keep people in the faith if so many people are marrying out and kind of dropping away. For this matter, this gets to be, if you can like take a story that looks like it's, and try to make it look old, you can say, hey, hey, look, the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, look at them. They tried to keep it in the family. They married the insiders. They <laughs> went out of their way to marry people that believed in the Lord God of heaven. And so it becomes instructional for the people at the time who have the question of what do we do with the with our foreign wives? You'll see it before that time too. Um, a lot of the time when it's in the time of the kings, 
we talked about it on Sunday that Ahab was a bad king because he married a Phoenician princess. Mm -hmm. He married outside of the family, which is why he was a bad king. If you marry inside the family, you would marry a Jewish or a Hebrew woman, and then you're a good king. And so all of that politics that is going on during the time of the kings and then in the exile influences why the story is here. So the overarching political idea is keep it in the family. Mm -hmm. That's so it's more about blood than it is about religion. Purity of, of is it about it is was it about religion to the the faith in a single god or their god or or is it about uh, And the same, the same blood, the same genealogy, it's the same. Which, which is is it both? I would say they aren't two separate ideas at this point. In time. Okay, at that point. Okay. I think our ideas are influenced a lot by like Euro European dynasties, where it very much is like the royal blood, and there's like blood quantum things of like how royal are you? You need to royal yeah. marry within the royal family and. A lot of other things it's less of that because they don't that idea basically hasn't come onto the scene yet but it's more of like staying within the culture that you know stay okay. family keep it in the family not because you only trust your family or you're trying to keep blood pure but it's one of those that it's outsiders are seen as temptations to follow a different way of life mm -hmm. Mary Ellen. Well, I'm listening and I'm mentally connecting this to back to our discussion um, in Matthew when um, uh, it's a Christmas story when Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem. And we were talking about how did everybody know who their relatives were there? And you made a comment that if they could recite their lineage, then they knew that they were part of the, the family group. And so the lineage thing um, continued to be an issue on, or um, not an issue because that's negative, but um, a priority um, all the way into New Testament times. And, you know, like, who's your family? And you know Abraham is I don't know if he's starting it, but it's definitely there. So that's actually a great point. I'm gonna pull out. Uh, let's go to the text here. Let me find where it is um, because it's something Rebecca says. Okay, here we are. So if you go to verse 24. Um, so this is after the point where we have this whole interaction by the well, we have, or we have the servant sent off, we have the servant praying and of exactly what he wants God to do. God answers before he stops talking and this young girl comes up, she's drawing water, she does all the things she's supposed to do. She's like, like everything is better than, ex than expected. And the servant asked, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night. And she says to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of, of Melech, who, whom she bore to Nahor. She does not introduce herself as Rebecca. She does not say, I'm Rebecca. Hi, my dad's this guy. She introduces herself with her lineage. She mm. puts that up front and it's like, this is my lineage. This is who I am. Not Rebecca, but the daughter, um, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Melech, whom she bore to Nahor. Nahor is Abraham's dad, by the way. So that's the connection. So she's fairly close in family. But yeah, that's um, like you said, she was able to recite the lineage and then the link was made. Mm. So yeah, there's a lot of, so there's like the two layers of this story. The first one is what we started with. Why does this story exist? It's kind of a 
a sermon illustration. It's a lesson to the people who were wondering about the question of who should they marry or who should they get to marry their children when it was a really big question and things were messy and complicated and there wasn't clear guidance. But then there's also the layer of the story of what else does this story say? Because this story is more than just like, thou shalt marry the people in thy own clan. It's more than that. And there's a lot of fun details. So let's rewind a little, or unless anyone has any comments about some of this lineage talk, let's rewind and actually talk about some of the details of what's happening, because there's a lot going on here. So, it starts off with Abraham and the servant having this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, what do you all make of this? Because this is not this is not how I found my husband. I will tell you. Oh. <laughs> the, the first, the yeah, the first thing I noted so was why that did he insist upon touching his thigh. That yes. that bond. I just I've never heard of that. Yeah, so we have this whole thigh action here. What's going on there? Larry, I heard you talking. What were you saying? Well, that was exactly what I was going to say. Was that a custom? Was that like uh, shaking hands or bowing down before an important conversation or what? So this, I can, I only know what I've read in commentaries and my the, the commentary here backs up the thing that I've always read. Um. Biblical language very rarely talks, or it likes to use induendos when it means other things. And so there's a question of how much of an induendo is here. The thing is, if you're putting your hand under someone's thigh, you're very close to reproductive organs. <laughs> and Abraham's like kind of power, the, the whole part of the covenant is literally the idea of him being the father of nations. That's where his seat, literally the seat of authority comes from, is him being the father. Av is literally father. He, his name, Avraham, is father of many. It's the, the, the direct translation. So he's putting his hand literally under the family jewels saying, this will continue. I will find someone for mm -hmm. your son, so your son gets to um, continue the line. So that is assumed. I don't know how common this is, okay. but in this context, it, it deals with the family jewels. Okay. So I know that would make me very uncomfortable to be asked to do something like that. That seems strange to me. <laughs> My Bible has a note about it. Would you yeah. like me to read that? It Go says putting it. the hand under the thigh, an old form of oath taking, reflecting the view that the fountain of reproductivity was sacred to the deity. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, the, the thing that I'm curious of is this is one I have not done research on, but I would I would be curious to find other sources that told people to do this just as like cross-referencing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's kind of a joke in archeology span that if you find something that you don't know what it is, well, it's a sacred object. Um, and so <laughs> saying something was like an ancient custom is sometimes just a way to say like, this is weird. We don't know why this is here. So, <laughs> so we have, um, so yeah, so we we have we've talked a little bit of like find my son a wife from my people, but notably there's a big emphasis on don't take him back there. We're not allowing Isaac to leave. We're asking more of my people to come to us. Once again, this is part of the covenant. Abraham was promised this land. That means they had we're not giving up the promise here but someone has to come to us. Um, and then Abraham makes this declaration um, that God will send an angel before you and will kind of like lead the way. So Abraham has complete faith in this process, it sounds, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm sending you, God will provide. There's gonna be an angel go before you. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you, any thoughts on Abraham's instructions or is this just like par for the course Abraham right now? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Ellen? I have a question, but um, mm -hmm. puzzles me is his comment that if she would not come, that um, the promise was null and void and um, this, the slave could come back or the employee could come back. But it was like, if she didn't want to come, null and void. And it, it's like, okay, what was plan B then? Um, you know? So, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting detail. Why does it matter that the woman must come on her own accord? Well, I, mean, I guess, you know, that's, that's not where my head is. It's, if she wouldn't come there wasn't another option for him in that community to bring, um, to look around for another woman of the lineage who would come. Um, and so, it, you know, it was null and void after, uh, obviously I'm struggling here. I'm, I'm confused why that was part of the plan that, you know, just one try. Uh-huh. Abraham was certain it was going to work. Wasn't yeah. it wasn't a necessity for plan B. And plan B was come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, then you've got to have another story as to what they're going to do after that. If the first yes. one doesn't work. Uh, it's the Abraham's idea doesn't cover all contingencies. It just, it, it only works if she agrees. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder so if they had tried, if had tried other women before that didn't work. And this was the last resort. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't know. So uh, that's just my <laughs> stupid mind working. But I, I think Abraham knew it would work. Sure. I just think he knew it because God was with them and God was with their people. Whoever wrote the story knows it's going to work. But if he knew it, why did he make this contingency? Maybe to reassure his servant. Well, or to reassure the women of the tribes that he's not forcing them into marriage. Right. She's going to do it of her own free will. I mean, I knew all along she was going to come, too. <laughs> I mean, the reader knows that. But I guess the people do. Maybe he wanted to reassure everybody that they would find a wife. So the, here's an odd bit of psychology. Now, this is not something that works 100% of the time. But they study. I've read studies that say if you're trying to convince someone to do something, if you give them the ability to say no, they are more likely to say yes. Yes. That in the way of saying, of like, you want someone to come to, I don't know, come to dinner. It's like, um, I want to invite you for my house to dinner tonight, but I understand you're busy. So like, if you can't come, that's okay. And literally giving someone the ability to say no makes people say yes more more on average more often and so there's a part where there's a little bit of psychology of like okay servant you're gonna go i am sure things are gonna work out but you you you're not gonna be punished if it doesn't happen so like go in confidence do your best and it actually might make the servant be better at his job knowing that he's not having to be afraid if he doesn't do his job well mm -hmm. That would be my guess. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it is interesting that there's both this very confident, like the angel will go ahead of you, it'll be prepared, but also if it fails, no worries. The good thing it worked was what would have happened. Right. <laughs> I thought, well, who's Isaac gonna marry then? <laughs> so, but I do wanna return to the idea of 
why does it matter that the woman is willing to come versus forced to come? Because we see at the end that like her family eventually goes like, okay, Rebecca, this is your choice. You can stay for 10 days, but this dude's leaving. So like, do you want to go or do you want to stay? And they ask her. Mary Ellen, I saw a hand. Uh, I think that if you're willing to go, you're um, in, I mean, you're willing to be a part of the future of the plan of be an active, willing participant in all the roles that are come to her. But if she's forced to go, then there's an attitude, there's a hostility, there's a, you know, I, I am being coerced into doing this and I'm not doing it with a willing heart. I'm not raising our children with a willing heart to the program, you know, the, um, the whole culture of that group of people. But if she's willing to go, then, then she'll jump right in. It's her family and um, be a wonderful wife for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you're changing people groups, like you're leaving the family center, you're going to somewhere where you may or may not have been and there's, they're seeking you out because you're the same as them, but they're somewhere where they're not in the same group of people. Yeah, it's much better to have someone who's like signed, like, okay, sign me up. I'm willing to do this versus someone who is resentful that they're being taken away from their family and people group, especially when it deals with like the covenant of God and God's gonna ask them to do some things. So yeah, willing participants are good in this case. And she's really quite enthusiastic, it seems. Really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But she, you know, it's interesting. They they do give women a chance to speak, but when you look at the lineage, they don't mention any women, any daughters. <laughs> but it's hard to tell with the names. But so actually, at, um, uh, you. It's sometimes hard to see, but they do pop up. So like when Rebecca gives her lineage, she actually does say um, a woman, a son okay. of M Milka. Milka. There, that's how you say it, Milka. It's broken into two, like it's hyphenated for me. It's on two different lines. Milka, who she bore to Nahor. So now, oh, yeah. uh, you do get one woman in her lineage. Mm -hmm. um, and in the lineage of Jesus, there's a few women sprinkled, but it is a patriarchal. They do say it by, by male lineage, but this is, I mean, other than like, we've talked about the dynamic between Sarah and Hagar, Rachel automatically has more agency than either of those women. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about her at the well. So we have the, the servant, he's made the trip with 10 camels. And his thing is, if, I, if the young woman gives me water and waters my 10 camels, which is a lot of water, then I'll ask her. And then like, as he's speaking, uh, Rachel saunters up, just a clarification of terms. It says a virgin, that just means a young girl. Um, that that term does not translate well in and out of Hebrew, which is why it's important that you get the clarifier later. There was a girl very fair upon looking a young woman whom no man had known. That's a better translation. Um, and so she has her water jug, she fills it up and the servant runs over, says, hey, can you give me a drink? She's like, sure. But at first she doesn't water the camels. And then when he's done, then she's like, okay, I'll water your camels now. And which is a lot of work um, because I mean, if you're thinking of like this big jug, if you think about the space between your arm and your hand, that's how big of a jug is. And she's doing that at least 10 times to water all the camels. What do you think about this, this prayer to God the immediate re answer and then Rebecca's hospitality to this utter stranger who just wandered into town with 10 camels. Mm -hmm. And a little gold. And some gold, <laughs> right, yeah. 
the hospitality is, is one of the very strong traditions, is, the, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Clay? Having to water 10 camels gives him the time to look her over. Ah, that's in that next um, line where it says he gazed at her in silence to learn yeah. whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Watering 10 camels gives him plenty of time to do that. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as she's finished, though, before he says anything to her, he gets out a gold nose ring and a couple of gold bracelets and puts them on her. And then asks her, whose daughter are you? Hmm. So one of the notes about this situation is that in this like Middle Eastern tribal society, the well is one of the few socially acceptable places for men and unmarried women to interact. Uh -huh. So that's why they're at the well. We see lots of interactions in the Bible at wells. That's because this is one place where Everyone needs to drink water, so it's okay if young women talk to men. It's like the acceptable place to do the things. Um, but yeah, there, there's this time of like, she's doing the actions, he's looking her over, and then we are presented with gold. What do you all think? <laughs> Is this payment or promise at this point? Mm. Well, I guess from the servant's viewpoint, uh, it shows that what he has been told has been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And now all he's got to do is convince her to come with it. <laughs> and, you know, what better than a little gold? <laughs> right. Well, if he... he... He, he sounds like he also could, knew immediately this was the person. So what is it in Rebecca's character that it's like, this is the one? What, what has she done that it's like, oh, other than just show up at the, at the right time? She's Whoa. very, yeah, she's very generous. She's very eager to please, uh, thoughtful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's willing. Um, to go above and beyond because she could have given him his water and then just gone back to her home with her, her jug. Um, but she was willing to jump in and do a lot of work, which flashed through my mind, or what are his servants doing while she's doing all this work? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah because his request is only for himself. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. And the servants are also able to get into the well and get their own. You know, it's not like they went thirsty. Um, but just just her attitude, the beginning attitude that she's willing to jump in, work, help, be pleasant at the time. Um, yeah, you know, not many young women would go that far. Right. So without even saying much, her actions are speaking here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so after being given some gold, after doing uh, some like manual labor on behalf of the strangers and the camels, she runs home, says, there's a dude at the well. Um, and her brother takes one look at her bracelets and nose rings and is like, I got to meet this guy. So what do we think of Laban? Laban's going to be a reoccurring character, so don't forget about him. What's our initial impression of this guy Laban, her older brother? Notably, I, her father is mentioned once. Laban is the acting head of the household. Um, so her father's kind of in question. Her brother is the one who's making the call here. But what do we think of him? <laughs> In this context, mm -hmm. so I'm looking at around, let's see, like verse 28 through 33. 
um, is kind of where we see the initial interaction with Laban here. Well, he rushes outside, but he readily accepts the man and invites him in. So his concerns must be, you know, he, he must immediately feel everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that seemed rather something. quick, rather sudden. Yeah. 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 Something on the bracelets. Uh, but, oh, this might be somebody or other I sort of know. And I think maybe we should go ahead and investigate this. Uh, he probably already knows that this is going to happen. Okay. Mary Ellen? Well, I was going to say we haven't at this point discussed the jewelry. Okay. And to me, a nose ring, you know, I immediately think on cattle and oxen that that's how you control them by putting um, a nose ring on and attaching a rope to it. Um, so I had a negative reaction when I saw the nose ring thing, but um, when she accepted the nose ring and the bracelets, um, th there was kind of a covenant established right then and there that, um, you know, she was buying into this whole idea and seeing whatever convinced him, he immediately welcomed um, and um, helped him with feeding the camels. And I mean, he jumped in to help and that and welcome him. Um, you know, so he never seemed to object to the situation at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Clay? Well, I had to look it up. And it said that being given a nose ring was a symbol of her suitability to marry Isaac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our, our Bibles both say earring, not nose ring. So <laughs> yours all says ring. Nose ring. Yours are ring's nose ring. Yeah. So um, this is one where piercing culture is very different. <laughs> um, we yes mary ellen i hear you with like the the like septum ring as like associated with cows no, this is a time where jewelry is displays of wealth you literally wore it on you and so people would wear it as much as possible and the nose is very prominent um and so like um uh, my time in india i would see people that would have like four nose rings like it, it wasn't uncommon to have both sides in the middle pierced or sometimes oh, people would have here. two but what about the one in here mm -hmm. yeah that, that happens that talking about the one that, between the two nostrils um with the size that they're talking about it's probably a nostril piercing they have hoops oh. that you can actually connect to your ear it's oh, just okay. It's all like how much me fancy metal can you display? Um, so yeah, nose rings are very common. It's a very prominent, cause it's on your face. It's a display of wealth. Oh. And so the fact that he's giving her a nose ring um, is kind of just like, I'm going to sh look at this small, this is a small gesture. And it's kind of like a drop in the bucket of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, if you're able to afford fancy nose rings. Um, and bracelets. So think of like bangles that like jangle together. That's also, that's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there, there's a suitability thing. I'm not sure of the exact connotations of each of the different pieces, but they wore earrings and nose rings. Um, even in ancient cultures, even men wore earrings and nose rings. You see it in the pharaohs. Yeah, Mary Ellen. Um, I think the fact that she accepted this from him mm -hmm. is really significant at this point because when her brother saw this, he already had a clue to what was going on here. And, um, you know, he, he immediately jumped in and went along with it and went above and beyond um, as she had done. And, you know, the, her whole family was making a commitment to this almost before they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So there is things going on with Laban. Like I said, well, Laban's an interesting person. We'll see him pop up later. I do think it's important to see that Laban, um, let's see, he, he joined them at the well. 
and then he saw the jewelry and then he invited him in. Rachel showed hospitality the moment he arrived. Laban showed hospitality after seeing the symbols, which yes, is kind of a cut, like very much Rachel is interested or Rebecca is interested at this point. She is interested in engaging. This seems like a promising prospect to your hand of jewelry. It's, it has those implications. Laban sees it, but he's seeing what's in it for Laban is my question. Cause we see that a little bit later on. What is Laban given in this whole interaction? Um, so like immediately after we have like the whole recitation of the story again, and Larry, your comment at the beginning of, yeah, if you didn't pay attention to before, you get it again here. Make sure you're paying attention. You hear all the promises mm -hmm. once again. This is just yeah. good Hebrew writing. You say it multiple times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, um, oh, actually jumping back just for a hot sec. Uh, in verse 31, we see Laban say, oh, come, come in, blessed one of the Lord. Once again, that is, God's proper name being used there. So it very much shows they both, they are worshiping the same God. So we have that established that they are Yahweh followers. You're a blessed one of Yahweh, come on in. We have the whole recitation of the story. Um, and we, I'm looking at 51 now. Um, uh, we have the end of kind of the, let's see. Then Laban answered, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you anything bad or good. Look, it is before you take her and go. Let her be your wife. It kind of is like, okay, like if God says that this is what's going to go happen, we're going to go along with the plan. This is what the God has spoken, kind of like, okay, sounds like a good deal. And then what happens directly afterwards, we get a lot of presents different people get a different amounts of presents. So what does Rebecca get out of this immediately? Other than like, she's going to get a husband, but she, in this moment, she gets a lot of stuff. Jewelry and clothing. Mm -hmm. Flocks and herds, is that what she gets? Mm -hmm. servants and camels. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. So one thing to know about ancient clothing the cloth itself is more expensive than the price to sew it together. Clothing is so extremely valuable just because it takes a lot of work to put it together. Um, and so clothing is very expensive. We are given a lot of costly jewelry. So all of a sudden, great, Rebecca is loaded. She is being showered in gifts. But then there's things given to her mother and to Laban. So he gave her brother and her mother costly ornaments. This is considered the bride price. Um, we see this in other stories as well, kind of like a dowry. Rachel, I keep saying Rachel, Rebecca is given a lot of stuff, but he is also compensating the family because someone who did a lot of work around the house is now being taken away. So it's uh, kind of the cost of replacing her either with getting someone like a, a new servant of whether it would be getting Laban a wife. We don't know if Laban has a wife, but this is the price of her being absent. And they are giving them some very costly things. They are loading Laban and his mother up. Is that why, is that why they want her to stay for 10 days? Well, what, what would be the benefit of having her stay, stick around a little longer? Like, why do that? Yeah. She might um, change her mind. Yeah, she might change her mind. Or were they looking for someone to replace her as a servant? Well, or maybe just getting used to her leaving the family. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Mary it's Ellen? It hurts between. <laughs> well, it's also asserting their ongoing influence on her. Um, they didn't just immediately give up, um, the, you know, I keep saying influence, influence on her. They could influence the servant to agree to the two week um, stay 
they they were asserting their dominance or control or whatever. And it was kind of a test to see if the servant would agree to it, if Rebecca would agree to it. And obviously they didn't, but it, you know, it was like kind of a try on their part if we still got influence in this situation or not. Mm. It may just have been purely emotional. Why do people go on treatment with terminal cancer? where the promise is maybe a couple of months. Yeah. You know, it's that, do you want to die tomorrow? Or maybe we can delay it a couple of months and give you a little more time <laughs> to get used to the idea. Yeah. So it's probably somewhere in between, to be uh -huh. honest. Like there, there's always multiple layers of, yeah, yeah. a mother is yeah. losing her daughter. Sure. And she's going far away, and there's no promise they're ever going to see her again. I know if it was like possibly a goodbye forever, yeah, I like yeah. it seems understandable that you would want to wait a little bit. Yeah, the mother may may have not given her the full instructions of what it means to be a wife. Like, here's yeah. some last minute, like, here's how you you do the wife things. I'm sorry, or but there is also there is power and control here can we influence her is she going to be is she going to listen to us or to her new family are we going to be able to get more out of this situation because if they listen to us can we continue a relationship and will this continue to benefit us because this dude's wealthy if this dude's wealthy and Rebecca listens to us. Can we get more wealth out of them? Okay, can we continue? Um, <clears throat> there was some communication, I'm sure, between the um, different communities. And uh, if this had been allowed, then they would be able to communicate and have at least tried to influence her while she was married to Isaac and, I mean, they weren't cutting the strings. And um, I think it's significant that Rebecca was like, no, I'm going, yeah, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready for my new life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's just like, peace, I'm out of here, bye. <laughs> so she is very, I mean, it kind of makes me wonder what's going on, Rebecca because she seems to accept a proposal at the well with the guy. And then when he's like, okay, I'm leaving tomorrow. She's just like, okay, let's go. Like either this girl didn't have the best home life or she's really craving some adventure here because she just, she's willing to drop everything at drop of a hat. Well, and she <laughs> yes. was given to her um, only indicates how much more is back at camp, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she doesn't seem really, so motivated by stuff, I don't think. I, 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 there's something in her personality, I think, that she is ready to become a woman and do something different. Uh, yeah. uh, what's in interesting to me is that there's no talk about the relationship between Laban and Abraham. Weren't they brothers? Um, no, Nahor was the brother. Uncle or what? I, I Na, think. The, uh, Rebecca's mother's father was Abraham's brother. Okay. According to my reckoning. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was, La I thought it was Laban. Okay. Yeah, no, Laban's her brother. So they, they're of the same. Laban is Rebecca's brother? Mm -hmm. Yes. Got it. All right. Yeah, he's just acting head of the household. He's not actually her dad. All right. So we have four minutes remaining. You all have done great. And I know this story is really long. We're going to wrap it up here with um, Isaac's uh, response. So we have uh, Rebecca's family sends her off with a blessing. May you go, sister, and become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. This, in some ways, 
<laughs> Wait, what was that? <laughs> that sounds like sort of a warlike blessing. It also has echoes of the covenant, though. Like, yes, there is some like warlike tones, but it's also, once again, we have myriads of offsprings and like, may you gain possession of the land. <laughs> because she is going to a land of of other people so it's like may you gain their gates um so but then they take off they arrive and kind of when the caramels are approaching isaac's just kind of like wandering in the fields evidently and what's our opinion of now adult isaac we've had isaac as a little boy nearly sacrificed now we have adult isaac what do we think of adult isaac in this situation They went out to meditate, so he obviously had true, true faith. Mm -hmm. And then he looked up and he saw these camels coming and he must have been wondering, wow, I wonder what this is. And then he found out and was very eager, <laughs> very eager. Yeah, yeah. The thing that's confusing to me, Rebecca looks over in the field and it's Isaac that she sees. And she says to the servant, who is he? And the servant says, it is my master. His master, I thought, was Abraham, the guy that sent him on this quest, not Isaac. It's both. Isaac's still over him. Isaac can give him laws. Can you? Okay. Yeah. So. Whenever they say he, it's confusing. Uh <laughs> Isaac wasn't consulted, apparently. They never told him that he was... Right. Was, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, and, and he was grieving for his mother, and this cheered him up a lot, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we find out part of the concern is, yeah, evidently Isaac was really sad when Sarah died. And so yeah. it, we get the retrospective of all of this was to cheer him up, um, but yeah, he wasn't consulted. So all of a sudden there's a bunch of people coming and it's like, oh yeah, that's your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Look what we brought you. <laughs> we got, we brought you a wife, in, here you go. Yeah. Might he have been told in the meantime though, and we don't hear that part of the story. That Abraham has told him, you know, yeah. we've, we've yeah. sent for a wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and it didn't take long for the two people, Isaac and Rebecca, to seal the deal. Um, I mean, that night they both were, um, well, she became his wife that night. And, you know, it's like, they're both instantly committed. <clears throat> so, you know, long lasting marriage here or, or good, good um, omens for a long and successful and uh, happy marriage between them so did they have a ceremony you wonder if they, if they had a is there a wedding ceremony or is it just going into someone's tent and then um we are low on time we can talk about this a little bit next time there is a marriage isn't what it is today it was much more contractual there was probably a party but it's not the same sort of thing the marriage okay. happens when you enter the tent. Just yeah, some okay. last details before we wrap it up today. So Isaac brings her to his mother, Sarah's tent. So she is not, that kind of signifies that she is now the matriarch. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have kept Sarah's tent. This is now hers. Notably, Abraham and Sarah have their own spaces. So now Rebecca has the tent of the matriarch. It is kind of the passing of the torch. She is now it um she became his wife so yes that is the act of they are now a coupled union but the detail that i actually love isaac and rebecca because you get some really lovely details and it says he loved her uh -huh. that is not like in the sense of like an action that is one of the few emotions we get and this is not used much in the genesis story and so it's literally signifying that like Isaac loved Rebecca in like a very sweet, a very emotional state, 
we don't get this with like Abraham and Sarah. They they were kind of just like these two people, but all of a sudden Isaac loves Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Well, he's only known her a couple of days. Abraham knew Sarah for eons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was just part of the furniture. <laughs> I guess so. You you all will see um there's some funny stories coming up about these two. Isaac and Rebecca are the like least like drama filled couple of the ones we will get in the story. They are actually fairly like calm compared to their parents and their children. So <laughs> But with that, it, I do want to respect our time. We're two minutes over. Uh, can I quickly pray us out for today? All right. Good and gracious God, it is always lovely to read a story about love. And sometimes love happens in ways that we don't expect, um, in ways that uh, sometimes is faster than we hope for and sometimes is slower than we expect. But God, help us to, in our daily lives, know when the right time to jump is. We see that Rebecca knew exactly when to say yes and took it, took the life by the horns and knew when you were calling her into a new way of being. And so we ask that you make those times very apparent for us, that we don't let your calling on us pass us by so that we can live in a way that you call us to and in a way that we can find that love the love of one another, the love of friends and community, and ultimately helps us cultivate a love for you and help us recognize your love for us in our daily life. So I ask that you bless everyone in this Bible study until we come together again to look again at the stories of the family of faith that started, that started us on our, <laughs> on our journeys that led us to today. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much. We, um, Thank you, Chris. Next week is the first of the month. So I once again have the meeting. So I'll see you not next week, but the week after. Okay. 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 All right. Take care.